Joining the How Did You podcast family today is Jeff Rowe. 29 years ago, he created the Leicester Comedy Festival, which is something that he never purposely intended to do. And I'm sure we'll jump straight into it. But Jeff, how are you doing today? And could you please tell us about yourself and how you created the festival while studying your De Montfort degree and how it was done instead of a Eastern European festival? Yeah, well, you've done your research, which is really good. Um, yeah, so um, I'll... Uh, I'll maybe tell you a bit more about me in a bit, but in terms of the festival, um, yeah, we were studying arts management at De Montfort University. Well, we actually, we were studying arts management at Leicester Polytechnic um, before it became a university. It became a university halfway through our degree. And um, in our final year, we had the opportunity to do a practical project. So our lecturers came to us and said, um, you can put on something, an event or a festival or something like that. I think in the previous years, they'd done a dance festival and I'm pretty sure they'd done a puppetry festival. But anyway, we had the opportunity to do something and um, you're absolutely right. One of our lecturers suggested that we would put on Leicester's first Eastern European theatre festival, um, which didn't sound terribly exciting it was probably very worthy um but we didn't really get excited about that and so this was in the summer of 93 so it was a summer term of 93 when we went to the student union, student union bar and met in our group and at the time we were mostly all music fans so we loved live music and we read a magazine every week called the nme um and that was kind of our Bible, really. And NME started to talk about comedy and stand up comedy, um, pr probably not alternative comedy, but contemporary comedy. Um, and it sounded really exciting. Um, and Rob Newman and David Baddiel were on the front cover of NME and they uh, sold out what was possibly the biggest comedy show uh, of its time at Wembley Arena. So comedy, live comedy was getting really popular and um, we'd never produced or promoted live comedy before. I think most of the group had never been to a live comedy show before, um, but we didn't let any amount of ignorance or naivety um, or inexperience get in our way. And one of our groups said, why don't we put on a comedy festival? And, um, and we thought that sounded more exciting than doing an Eastern European theatre festival. So. So we said, yeah, OK, why not? Um, now, I probably should point out that the university were um, after their dis after they got over their disappointed dis disappointment of the European thing, um, they were very supportive and also so were the venues and promoters in the city. Um, but uh, we we kind of worked with them and we had a little consortium made up of various people and um, and yeah, we put on Leicester Comedy Festival in 1994 and it was it was really real. Um, so we got Norman Wisdom um, and Tony Slattery to be patrons. Um, we booked uh, Harry Hill to do a gig, Matt Lucas, John Shuttleworth, two comedians who you may have never heard of called Rona Cameron and Donna McPhail, who were amazing. Nick Park, who created Wallace and Gromit, came. Um, it was like a proper festival um, and looking back on it, it was quite successful. About 5,000 people came, um, which at the time felt a massive deal. And it was great fun. It was it was it was really good. Um, and uh, yeah. And then you'll probably ask me questions about what happened next. So I will pause <laughs> there and not take the wind out of your tails. 29 years ago, you were 22 and you were heavily inspired by the NME. But what was life like 22 years ago? Who was Jeff? Who did he look up to? And what did he look forward to? Or what was he interested in? Um, so, all right, I'll start. I'll start in with your last question and then work forwards. <laughs> I, um, I grew up in a very sleepy village uh, in Buckinghamshire and... Um, there wasn't a lot to do. And when I was 13, um, I went home and said to my parents, I'm going to book the local village hall and I'm going to put on a concert. Um, goodness only knows where this came from. Um, I'd sort of been to some small festival type things in the 
before that. Um, and my brothers always used to moan that I was the one that used to organise. You know, I was the annoying little brother who at Christmas and birthday parties would say, come on, we're all going to do this. And, you know, I, I was always sort of organising things, I suppose. Um, so I put on this gig and um, I booked a band and I booked the village hall and a friend of mine made some posters and you know it, it wasn't Glastonbury by any stretch of the imagination but it it was really good fun and I loved it and um so I did another one and this you've already aged me by declaring my age in 94 but um uh I I, I actually put on some discos um and, which is what they were called nowadays they would be called club nights but I'm so old that they were called discos and um so I put those on and I and I put on more bands and other people, you know, local bands that gigged in pubs got in touch and said, can we can we do a gig? And so throughout my teenage years, I promoted music um, and I sort of wanted to be I didn't really know what it was called, but I knew I wanted to do it as a job, I suppose. So I didn't know that the word promoter existed or producer or anything like that. Um, so throughout my teenage years, I put on gigs and then one of the bands that I liked um, had a very small, um, they owned their own record label and fan club. So it was very kind of DIY -y and um, and they kind of did this in London. And so I, I kind of said to them, I want to come and uh, volunteer and work for you for my summer holidays. And uh, the story goes, and it's true, that they wrote back and said no. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. You're a very generous offer, but no. And I wrote back and said, uh, there seems to be some confusion. Um, I'm offering to come and work for you for six weeks in my summer holidays for free. And um, and I'd really like to do that because it's, I think, you know, you know, this is the sort of thing I'd like to do as a job. And they wrote back and said, no, there's been no confusion whatsoever. The answer's still no. Um, and I wrote back and said, uh, no, they're, they're, no, you don't seem to understand. I, and anyway, um, they eventually probably just to shut me up, said, oh, right, okay, you can come. So I went and worked with them. And then I went and worked in with them for a year. I don't think I got paid. Maybe I did, I can't remember, but before I came to Leicester. So, you know, I wanted to be a music promoter. Um, I wanted to book bands and that's kind of all I knew really. And when I worked in London, they toured a lot around the UK. So that kind of classic thing of getting into a transit van and driving up and down the M1. Um, I did that uh, with them and it was fab. It was really, really good. Um, and then my brother, who was at the other university in Leicester, said, um, and there's a course that you really ought to go on. So I applied and got a place at Leicester Poly, which then became DMU. Um, so I suppose what happened then was... Uh, I kind of got exposed to all sorts of different performance styles. I mean, there was an, I don't know how much you or people listening will know of this kind of world, but I suppose it was called live art. And there was lots of weird stuff on stage at a venue that, well, it is still there actually, but the old Phoenix Arts Centre in Leicester, which is now the Sue Townsend Theatre um, on Newark Street, was a real kind of... Um, hotbed of of weird stuff that I'd never I didn't even know this stuff existed you know and I went to my first contemporary dance performance and they did contemporary music and lots of unusual things that I'd never seen before um and but still I think I wanted to promote live music I remember I did I had to do I had to write reviews of live shows and I remember, I can't remember the other band, but I, I said I wanted to review the Inspiral Carpets who were performing at the Student Union and somebody else. And I can't remember who the other band was, but they were bands. And my lecturer was kind of quite, quite disgusted that I wasn't going to re re review some sort of innovative live performance art that was happening. And I was going, well, I don't like that. I just like, I'd quite like the Inspiral Carpets at the time. And so I thought, well, I'd review that. So I sort of, you know, maybe I'm sounding a bit like I was a sort of, you know, um, rebel. I wasn't in the slightest, but I just wanted, I was very focused. So when I did my placements, I went and worked at music agencies um, and uh, and all that kind of stuff. And then the festival turned up um, 
And I kind of liked comedy before that, I suppose. Um, I hadn't seen a lot of live comedy. It wasn't sort of on my radar, really. Um, but, uh, but we did the first festival. And then I think I was a bit confused. I didn't really know, you know, when you graduate from De Morphy University, which no one had ever heard of in those days, with a degree in arts management, um, if you don't want to move back to London, which is where I was before I came to Leicester, um, you, you, your choices were quite limited in terms of in terms of employment, particularly if you were going to stay in Leicester. Um, so I and two friends from the course, uh, in the absence of any other employment, decided to do the festival again, um, and it was sort of a kind of a hobby really I mean we sort of thought at the time that we were deeply professional and I guess to a certain degree we were um but um uh in that second year we got uh 25,000 pounds sponsorship from a company called Intercity Midland Mainline which and is now called East Midlands Railway but it's, it's a train company basically and they gave us 25 grand which was a lot of money and did make me go oh my goodness that was a kind of defining moment really that somebody was prepared to do that um but I just kind of wanted to I've never really been motivated by money um I didn't want to just get it you know I did have plenty of jobs I worked behind the bar of numerous venues in the city I was a dustman for a bit um I did that was how I paid my rent um but I didn't I kind of was quite keen not to just go and get a job um I was I kind of I don't know people have called it different things over the years but I sort of wanted to follow my passion or whatever and by that point you know I'd nearly been promoting live shows for almost 10 years if I started at 13 I mean, in fact it was 10 years probably um and I kind of wanted to to do that and, and I suppose the other thing to add into the conversation is I love I do like festivals um I do I haven't been to loads in my, in my life, but I kind of like moments for people to celebrate and communities to come together. And I, and I think there's something quite fizzy about those things. So, you know, whether it's Glastonbury or the Edinburgh Fringe or Leicester Comedy Festival or whatever it is, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of people. And I also like the fact that behind the scenes, there's this whole community of people that come together to put on something. You know, and I would extend that to, you know, things like Bonfire Night and, and those kind of established traditions, you know, it's, there is something exciting and, and fizzy and buzzy um, about all of that. So I kind of thought, well, if I can get away with it for a few more years and I'll organise this thing um, with my two friends from university who, um, who after a few years decided to go and get proper, proper jobs where they were paid money. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to give it a go, I suppose. I never in a million years thought it would go on for nearly 30. I mean, it's 29 years this year. So next 2023 will be the 30th anniversary. Um, that was never the plan. Um, I mean, there was no plan. There was we just did it every year. It was really enjoyable. And then and then we kind of did it again. And there was no business plan. There was no finance. I mean, apart from the sponsorship money, there was no finance behind it. Um, it was it was sort of a hobby, really. So I've no idea whether that ramble answers your question or not, but uh, hopefully it does a bit. Focusing more on yourself, a few years ago, you were given a British Empire medal. Yes, I was. That must have been crazy because you talk about doing the Leicester Comedy Festival as a hobby and not wanting to go back into London with your friends. So there must have been some kind of euphoria there. Uh it was very strange. Um, um, so, um, yeah, it, I mean, any, any of those sorts of things, you know, I, I, um, I sound like I'm bragging, but I also got an honorary doctorate from De Montfort University. Um, and it just feels really odd um, that, I mean, I know the festival is really important and I will fight for the festival probably not until I die but I would fight a long way for the festival I think it's really important for loads of reasons and lots of people really like it um uh but 
you've heard of the sort of phrase of imposter syndrome and you know and it's just it's just me uh, and a group of people who are very dedicated kind of still messing around making this thing work you know you said at the beginning you know you contacted me and i replied um you know it's not we're not some mega corporation it's just a bunch of people who think it's a good thing and other people seem to think it's a good thing so we carry on doing it and then when you suddenly come home from holiday and there's a letter on the doormat literally from buckingham palace um going that the queen would like to give you a medal it's just i'm trying not to swear but it's just bloody weird you can feel, um, feel free <laughs> okay all right well i might do later uh, um <clears throat> it's just peculiar and um and i suppose you know comedy in particular is seen as being somebody described it years ago as being illegitimate so you have legitimate art right which is theater and dance and even spoken word and poetry and um you know, all of that visual art is is proper. It's, you know, it's funded by the Arts Council and people, you know, comedy still is quite often, I think, and it's changed during COVID a bit, but people just see it as a, you know, as a as an illegitimate thing. Um, and I think there's pluses and minuses to all of that. Um, all I do is organise a comedy festival every February in Leicester, of a, of a, you know, and, and, and then to get this um, bloody medal is... It is euphoria, but it's also, it's also, you know, uh, what on earth is going on? This is just ridiculous. Um, that something that I set up and and me and others have worked really hard on and all of that. Um, it's 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 crazy. If I was running that Eastern European Theatre Festival, right, the director of that festival that thank God never existed, that director will get a medal from the Queen and an honorary doctorate from Dumbledore University and other stuff, right? Me, I don't, it's weird. It's just, it, it's weird. So it is euphoria, but it's also um, what on earth is going on? This is just insane, really. Um, but it does make me, it does make me very proud. It must make you very proud because alongside some of these very important accolades like your doctorate, your British Empire medal, you also partnered the festival with Dave and that was quite big because it was such a huge sponsor. That was very peculiar as well, really, because that, you know, a number of people have said, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what impression you're getting of me, but some people have said, uh, oh, what a strategically brilliant decision that was, Jeff. Uh, I bet it took ages, you know, of, of um, coming up with proposals and, uh, and um, you know, approaching people like Dave and UK TV. And uh, well, it wasn't like that at all, really. It was just a bit of an accident that I met a bunch of people and... Um, we got on and we chatted and we had a nice time. And uh, I think one of the things that I tell other people um, about my apparent career is um, uh, meet as many people as you possibly can and, and have no idea what it is you want from them, um, which is kind of the opposite to what I think people are taught. People are probably taught that when you meet people, you need to have a very clear, you know, you need to have an elevator pitch and you need to have a very clear understanding of what you want from them, right? Um, I don't, sometimes that's true, but also sometimes it's important for people to like you and people to trust you and people to get um, that fizziness that I talked about earlier on, that people get that from you. Um, and, and if they don't like you, if they don't trust you, if you don't think you're a kind of buzzy person and you've got stuff to, to talk about, it doesn't matter what you say to them about what you want. They were not, they're not going to listen to you, are they? Because they're not, you know, they just don't. Um, why would they? So, um, so the Dave lot um, I met um, uh, and we got on and we had a nice time and we sort of just started to talk about what might be possible. Um, but it did turn out to be a defining moment for the festival. I think, um, you know, I think the Dave brand uh, fitted really well. If it, if it had been the B&Q Leicester Comedy Festival, it wouldn't have been quite so good, um, I don't think um so dave were yeah it was brilliant and we worked with them for five years and um it really helped position us and move us from being a, a pretty good leicester festival that had some national awareness to absolutely being a i think um being a national festival that just happens to be based in leicester and uh yeah um it was it, it was it was really hard when they stopped so the deal 
um, was a year on year deal. So they didn't sign up for five years. They signed up for a year and then they liked it and then they did another year and so on and so forth. So therefore every year they could potentially have gone. Um, and indeed after five years they did. And that, that was hard because, um, well, you lose all the money for starters, which is difficult, but also you, you know, really practical things like you have to change the logo and you have to change all your branding. And that obviously costs a lot of money to do. And um, so that was a difficult, I can't actually remember the year, I want to say 2018, but I can't remember. Um, that was a difficult year. Um, there have been quite a lot of difficult years, um, but that one was hard, but I wouldn't have not done it in hindsight. I think it was really good to do it. And um, yeah, just put us in a different league really, I think. For the 2018 festival, you're looking for a new title sponsor, but all year round, big difference company, a company that you'd founded, registered, and just created realistically off your own back alongside with a few friends, employs people throughout the year doing multiple of different events. But what do you think made it so successful? Was it the fact that, say, Richard III being found to be from Leicester, the Leicester winning the Premier League, did that help boost the Leicester Comedy Festival? Or do you think it's because of the fact that you'd been doing it for so many years and you had such great experience in it? Okay, so it's all it's all of those things, yeah. really. It, 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 it's, um, I mean, I think, you know, people do say, how have you managed to do it for such a long time? And just bloody mindedness, really, and perseverance. Um, so I, I talked earlier on, I think, about passion and excitement and, and energy. And I think I still have that around the festival. Um, but, you know, so do, so do other people. It's not just me um, being an irritating person every year going, well, we've got to do this bloody thing. Um, you know, there's other people <laughs> that are irritating as well uh, who are involved. So... Um, I think part of the reason why we're still here is because we've done it for so long, you know, and, and you sort of, if we weren't, if we weren't doing something right as a festival, you would have hoped that we would have given up by now um, because 30 years, 29 years, 30 years is a long time to keep banging the drum for something that doesn't work. So I think, I think uh, the festival is still here because, because it's, because it works and it does have an impact, I think. Um, and we've worked really hard to try and transform the festival as much as we can every year. So the festival now is unrecognisable to how it was 10 years ago, let alone 29 years ago. And um, I mean, it's still obviously based in Leicester and it's a comedy festival, but um, we try really hard to make it exciting. I think there are a lot of festivals, not a lot, there are some festivals that just repeat the same thing every year and they're not, they're not very exciting. And I think we also have worked hard to, and this sound, this makes me sound like a bureaucrat maybe, but embed what we do in different communities. So um, I've got a meeting this week with, um, with the, with the hospitals in Leicester. Right. And, um, and I know, I know the Bishop of Leicester and I know the Dean of the Cathedral and I know the Chief Constable and all these people we have worked with um, and continue to work with um, kind of, give a shit about the festival um, and and schools get involved and faith groups get involved and libraries get involved and so I think it's been quite an inclusive thing the festival um, and we have now for years we struggled to have a kind of community of people who get who cared about it but I think now we probably have got that um, so I think that's helped to sustain it um, just being bloody minded and just keeping on doing it and and talking talking to people about it and um you know and that community of interest is not just a Leicester one it's also I think I think comedians care I think certainly over the last couple of years you know when when the whole Covid thing kicked off and started you know I genuinely sat in this room in my office at home and famous comedians you know not hundreds but some famous comedians would contact me and say it must be terrible for you at the moment. What can we do to help? Um, and and that's that's astonishing, you know, because it's the same same answer as I gave before. Is you know, I sit in this room tapping away on my laptop, 
thinking, well, people say it's important, but is it? I don't know, you know, I mean, I think it's important, but, and to have some of these people contact you and go, you know, it is, it's been really important, it's really nice. So I'm rambling again, but it's, there's lots of reasons why the festival has sustained itself and organisationally, to go back to your point about big difference, um, in the early years, one of the things that we really struggled with was the fact that because it's an annual festival, we would recruit staff to put on the festival. The festival would happen. And then probably three, four, five months after it, we'd run out of money. We'd have to make everybody redundant. And then two months later, we'd get some money. And then because our cash flow was so terrible, we couldn't weather the storm. Um, and that was really frustrating because we lost some really good, passionate, committed people who loved the festival, but we just couldn't pay them. Um, and, and most people, when they have a job, they expect to get paid. Um, so uh, the year round stuff that you talked about initially was a way to keep income coming in um, uh, in order to, to weather those months where there was no money from the festival. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's lots of reasons why the festival still exists. You speak about the fact that these such big groups, such big people, and how you've got a relationship with them all. But there must have been a certain target range you're aiming for, because not only do you create the Leicester Comedy Festival, you also created the UK uh, Kids Festival. This must have been a whole year long stress, because as long as you were planning one festival, you were also planning another one to run alongside it. That um, was not my greatest moment. <laughs> um yeah so it was created on a whim um so um for a long time people have said uh so jeff when's your next festival when when are you going to create another one and i fam well, famously i don't say famously but people who know me know that my answer to that is never i'm never creating another festival and people in my team remind me quite a lot that I always said, I'm never creating another festival. And then uh, four years ago, um, we were getting close to the deadline for the festival. And I think I noticed that there was quite a lot of stuff for children and young people. And for a long time before that, the, the most questions we would get from the public were, can we take our 14 year old son or daughter to this show? Can, you know, what's suitable for my eight year old? <coughs> So we had that for a while. And then I noticed looking through the programme before deadline day that there was quite a lot of kids and family stuff. And so almost literally um, overnight, I thought, let's have a UK Kids Comedy Festival. Um, and we then, I think it was like the next day or something, we got um, support from um, a couple of sponsors who thought this was a great idea. Um, and gave us some money and uh yeah within three weeks probably uh we'd created this other festival i mean it sits alongside leicester comedy festival so it's the same dates um and and stuff but it's really it's gone really well and i think there is a big appetite for comedy performance um you know stuff in schools and workshops but also just shows that parents may be or uncles or whatever, aunts, whatever, um, want to take kids to. And also kids are, are so com so much more comedy savvy than I was when I was 14, certainly. Because they all watch on you, you know, on YouTube. I don't know where they watch it, TikTok, um, or whatever platform they choose to watch it on. Um, people, young people watch comedy all the time. So um, yeah, we 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 set that up. Um so in 2023, it'll be 30 years of Leicester Comedy Festival and five years of the UK Kids Comedy Festival. You speak about children becoming comedy savvy, but in 2019, a pandemic hit us and it shows that we all had to adapt. We all had to change things. So you took the festival online. Do you think that with people and children becoming more online savvy, this helped your festival? Oh, God. I mean, right. I will preface this by saying... <laughs> Compared to some people, um, my life has been a breeze for the last two years. You know, COVID and the pandemic have hit people really hard. I don't want to state the bloody obvious, but, you know, people have died. And mm -hmm. so I am not this. I understand in the great hierarchy of who's had, who's had a shit time during COVID. 
I'm at the bottom, right? Because a lot of people have had a dreadful time, but it's been awful um, for me and for the team. And it's been really hard. And it's the hardest, of course, it's the hardest, despite I mentioned earlier on about money worries and not having money to do the festival and all of that. Compared to that, COVID's been much worse. Um, just, well, not just because, because we the whole the whole parameters of what we do were just blown out of the water, really. So, I mean, of course, running a live festival for 27, 28 years as it was, um, it very quickly became apparent that that wasn't going to happen. Um, but just everything else that goes into putting the festival on kind of disappeared, you know. Um, so comedians were, were working in Morrison's and, and other supermarkets are available, um, but were stopping doing comedy. Therefore, we couldn't book so many comedians because they were going to get other jobs because they had to earn money because they weren't earning money from comedy. Agents, management companies were all furloughed. Um, you couldn't talk to anybody um, in the sort of industry because it had been decimated. Um, Sponsors, uh, people who invest in in the festival, were at risk of losing their jobs or their businesses going bust. Um, we could, you know, we couldn't do live shows. We couldn't. Nobody knew what was happening, so we could. We would talk to, I don't know, somebody in a venue, and what what are you doing in February? We've got no idea. Everything just disappeared. Um, and we we work as a team really collaboratively, I think. And so, you know, just just having that buzz and that energy in the office. Um, was not there and zoom and teams and everything are great but there's it's not the same um, mm -hmm. so it was really hard but um we in 20 god <laughs> what year are we in now 2022 so in 2020 it would have been we ran a live festival and i think in 2020 we were the COVID started in 2020, right? Am I right? Or am I embarrassing myself? It must have been. Uh, COVID-19, so I'm assuming, well, when did we fully go into lockdown? What, 2020? March yes. 2020? Yes. Yeah, March 2020, right. Okay, yes. So in February <laughs> 2020, we were, one of the, we were one of the only UK festivals that happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened and lockdown happened and everything. But one of the best decisions that... I think we ever made was that there would be a festival in 21. We had no idea what it would look like, but it was really important to keep our brand alive. Um, because if we hadn't, if we'd all been furloughed, if we'd all gone off and got other jobs, we wouldn't have been talking to the, to the people who were around um, to talk to about the festival. Um, so it then became really obvious. Well, no, it didn't actually. It became at the, in the autumn of 2020 we thought we were going to put on a live festival in 21 and everyone was telling me oh this it'll be gone don't worry about that you'll be fine by february don't worry christmas you know it'll be all right they're not going to cancel christmas all that happened um and then it was something like the 4th of january um our esteemed prime minister stood up and said I'm sure he stood up in Downing Street and said, Jeff Rowe in Leicester, if you're listening, if you think you're going to be running a comedy festival, you've got another thing coming. Um, and I'm sure he said that. Um, <laughs> and so we had to pull it and we had to just move everything online and um, full credit to our team who managed to do that. And um, it was good. I'm really glad we did it. A lot of people around the world watched Leicester Comedy Festival and all of that. Was it anywhere near as good as a normal festival? No, of course it wasn't. Um, and, and, and all of those buzzy things and excitement and all that were a fraction of what they normally are. Um, but I'm really glad we did it because it, um, it kept us going and it kept our partners engaged, um, you know, our business partners and sponsors and all of that. Um, and we couldn't, we, we still, we couldn't do the festival if we didn't have that support from other people. So, um, yeah, but it was hard. I mean, it was, yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. It was, you know, sitting in this office on my own for, I mean, it's nearly two years. Mm -hmm. um, is It's hard to run a festival like that. It really is. Um, but we managed. can't imagine what it was like because I was at uni and that was stressful enough. But, Jeff, on a personal level, where do you see yourself in a year's time? Uh, 
well, specifically in a year's time, will be planning for an enormous party to celebrate <laughs> 30 years of Leicester Comedy Festival. And um, I'll probably embarrass myself uh, at that party, probably because I'll people will buy me too much alcohol. Um, so let's not dwell on that um, right now. Uh, but that's bound to happen, really. I've I've no I've, I've no idea really um, is the honest answer, and and I feel I've often felt when people ask me this question that I should come up with some sort of showbiz answer to it. But my my ambition for the festival is that it keeps going, um, and you know people don't ask me this so often anymore. But they used to say, "Oh, when's it going to be as big as the Edinburgh Fringe?" And do, 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 do. they don't ask that so much anymore. But the, I've got no idea. Um, I want it to keep going, which is a feat in itself um, to raise the money and 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 the infrastructure that's required to run the festival. Um, I want it to keep going. I want it to keep morphing and evolving. I don't want it. If I repeat the programme from last year again, I'll be really disappointed. And that's probably the time for us to stop when it just becomes stagnant and dull and repetitive. So we've got to think of some new things and, and, oh, and we do that quite a lot, I think. Um, and for me, I don't know. I, I, um, I never thought I would be doing this for 30 years. Um, and I don't know, I don't have a burning desire to do anything else. Um, I would really like to think, and I'm pretty confident that the festival will outlive me, um, not necessarily because I'm going to die, but because um, I think I'll, at some point I will stop, won't I? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I really don't want to be the 80-year-old who's wheeled in in a, in a wheelchair and can't hear anything but everybody's like oh and that's the guy that started the festival and I'm sitting there recounting all the stories that I can remember oh I remember in 98 when you know I don't know Harry Hill said this and I mean that's not me um, yeah so uh I don't know I don't know what I don't know um but but keeping it going is important right because it's important to Leicester but it's also important to comedy and it's important to audiences and and I think now more than ever before people keep telling me over and over again that we could do with a laugh um and uh you know I think the value that's attached to comedy now is very different to what it was like two years ago you know I said earlier on about the illegitimacy of comedy and it's just a laugh isn't it it's just people standing on stage telling rude jokes and we go out for a night out um, well, I think now we value nights out a bit more than we did two years ago. And, and I think comedy and laughter and humour, there's loads of evidence that shows how important it is to individuals' mental health and well-being, and how important it is to communities and to bring people together for, you know, non-religious faith-based festivals. It's, it's a very um, uh, democratic thing, I think. Um, and so uh, long may that long may that continue. But in terms, I don't know. Um, you know, like lots of people, um, we got we got a dog during lockdown. Um, I'd like to spend more time walking my dog. Um, but you know, I always want to keep working on the festival. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm not giving you a very good answer. But I've never known. <laughs> uh, when we graduated, you know, the idea of doing it again initially was just ridiculous. And we did it again and we did it again and we did it again. And that lasted for about 10 years and we just kept doing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Let's focus on the current 29th year of the Leicester Comedy Festival. What's this year's festival going to be like? Um, well, so I'm really conscious that uh, we are, I hope I'm not uh, giving anything away, but we're recording this at uh, quarter to midday <laughs> on the 24th of January, and we start on the 2nd of February, mm -hmm. uh, which is just over a week away, and we all know that the world can change dramatically in that amount of time, right? So um, I can tell you what I think it's going to be like. Um, but then you'll have a, you'll have a, you know, you'll have a global scoop um, when everything's pulled and we have to go back online and it's not going to happen. But so this year's festival is um, pretty, um, pretty much the size of what we were like in 2020. So it's almost back to normal. It's not quite as big, but it almost is. And, um, you know, there's, there's famous people coming. Um, I'm, 
thrilled to bits at the comedians who've agreed to be interviewed by me uh, during the festival because that's great and it raises money for the festival but it's mm-hmm. also a bit of a coup really and I've I have been so lucky uh, the number of people that I've interviewed on stage during previous festivals um, so there's a whole lot and then and then there's a load of new people and emerging comedians I'm sure there'll be comedians who are just over the moon about the fact that they're performing on a stage in front of an audience um, as opposed to on a bloody zoom call or you know, zoom call, but you know what I mean um, <laughs> um, so there's loads of stuff uh, there's loads of stuff in the kids festival there's discussions there's seminars we've tried to get it back to mm-hmm. how as close to how it was in 2020 as possible and um and i'm not the right person i do I, i'm not i'm not the right person to sort of um market and promote the festival because uh because you're probably i don't know you might ask me you might not but other people normally at this point saying who are you looking forward to seeing jeff and it's like well i don't it doesn't really matter who i'm looking forward to seeing it matters who you want to go and see and what the audience wants to go and see so uh, get hold of a brochure or look online and see uh, who you want to go and see and go and see some stuff. Um, it's it's irrelevant, I think, what I'm going to look forward to seeing. Um, and what I want to go and see is completely different to what you might want to go and see. So there's no point in me waxing on about people I want to go and see because it's, it's pointless. Um, it will be, he confidently says, amazing to be back doing live stuff and and hopefully we will get uh a buzz in the city center and around venues and you know safely of course and you know with appropriate um stuff but yeah absolutely cross your fingers because that's i've always liked even when i was 13 i never wanted to be on stage i wanted to be standing at the back of a small venue of the montfort hall of whatever it is and just being pleased that I've had some role to play in terms of making all those people laugh and making that event happen. Um, and if I can go back to to going from venue to venue to see stuff happening with people enjoying themselves like we used to in the olden days, then um, then that'll be awesome. Um, so yeah, and and also thinking, oh my god. Everyone keeps asking me, everyone keeps saying, they don't ask me, everyone keeps saying, oh, Jeff, we know you for the 30th anniversary next year. You're going to have some special things lined up, aren't you? Oh, who are you talking to at the moment? And it's like, the honest answer is, I'm talking to virtually no one about next year's festival. I don't know. Um, but I imagine I have to think of something exciting to do because it's the 30th anniversary next year. So um, watch this space. I normally give some sort of showbiz answers to that question, but it's... Um, uh, I've got no idea what it'll be like. Anyway, ask me another question if you want. Are you going to be up on stage doing a <laughs> comedy show? No. No, I, <laughs> no. No. Are you? Oh, God knows. Doubt it. But if you had to give one bit of advice to sum it all up and wrap it all up, what would you give? Who would you give it to and why? <sighs> Um, well, for anybody who wants to sort of be a producer or a promoter um, or a festival director or organiser or whatever, um, just just do it um, and you'll mess up loads and it will be terrifying. Um, but but just just do it and don't worry. This is a sort of complete opposite, I think, of what probably people are taught at university. But don't worry too much about the process and about the um, infrastructure and the business model. And you know, I know when I graduated, I spent a bit of time going to the bank, and um, there were various agencies out there that could help people who wanted to set up their business. You know. And, and they would talk to me about things that I had to do. And I, and I remember saying to them on one occasion, oh, surely what I, what I need to do is get some really good comedians to come and perform as part of the festival. Surely that's, that's kind of the most important bit. 
no, 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 no. You need to do your profit and loss account and you need to do your spreadsheets and your balance sheets and you need to do this, that and the other and your price point and your market um, survey to find out who your competitors are. And I was thinking, no, I don't. I just need to get some good comedians to come and perform. So so don't worry too much about the infrastructure. Um, you will get to a point where you need to worry about the infrastructure, right? Otherwise it won't be sustainable. But in your first few years, don't worry about that. And then the other thing I would say, which is um, which echoes, I guess, what I've said so far, is um, just network like crazy. And you know, I know it might. I don't know how to do it. Right? I only know how I've done it. Um, but but I sort of thought in the back of my mind when I got the. I don't know whether it's an opportunity, but when I was in a room and I, I could meet the Bishop of Leicester, in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, he, he might be helpful at some point, and it might be helpful to have a relationship with the Bishop of Leicester or the Chief Constable or the Director of Public Health. Um, I don't quite know what it is yet, but if we get on, if we trust each other and all that, then, then that's a good starting point, really. So follow your passion and your excitement the boring infrastructure stuff will come at some point you can't ignore it forever but you can ignore it for a while and network like crazy and um and nowadays it's so easy to, to you know you reached out to me on social media and it's so easy to do it um and and just build build your brand build your network um and and i do sort of think well at the end of the day if it doesn't work, you can go and get a proper job. Um, but give it a go. And um, uh, if you're good, uh, people will respect that, I think, and will follow it. So um, that's some of the advice. Um, and certainly my last piece of advice is don't you dare set up another Leicester Comedy Festival. Um, if you want to set up a comedy festival, do it in Bradford or uh, somewhere where there isn't one. But if, if you dare do it in Leicester, I will come for you. Uh, I'm joking, of course, I don't care really, but, um, but try not to do one in Leicester, otherwise I'll be very unhappy.